want to welcome everybody uh, to Alt Liberal Arts uh, event online webinar uh, on the assault on critical race theory with Maya Wiley. Um, Alt Liberal Arts supports academic freedom for students and scholars. Uh, it's an initiative offering alternative and online learning platforms to fill the gaps created by bans, censorship, and threats uh, that result in self-censorship. Uh, so we're really excited to be working with Alt Liberal Arts. Um, my name is Eric Wallenberg. I was a visiting assistant professor of history at New College of Florida last year from uh, fall 2022 to spring 2023. And I was effectively fired uh, for the work that I do, um, though no reason was given by interim President Corcoran on why my contract was not renewed. Um, we can assume, all we can do is assume uh, the work that I did in teaching U.S. history and the construction of race through law, policy, and practice uh, had some effect on uh, my non-renewal. Um, but I'm excited to be here tonight uh, as part of the New College Diaspora uh, to welcome you all for this event tonight, uh, The Assault on Critical Race Theory with Maya Wiley. Um, I get to introduce Dr. Marvin Dunn, who will be joining us here to introduce uh, Maya Wiley. Dr. Dunn uh, is a professor emeritus of psychology at Florida International University. Among many other projects and distinctions, Dr. Dunn is the founder and director of the Miami Center for Racial Justice, founded in the wake of the killing of George Floyd and the uprisings that followed. Dr. Dunn is the author of several books, including A History of Florida Through Black Eyes and Black Miami in the 20th Century. Uh, I actually first met Dr. Dunn on the campus at New College uh, when a group of faculty invited him to come along in April and lecture to my U.S. history class, to meet with some faculty, and to do a campus-wide lecture uh, on the attacks on Black studies, African American history, and the broader attacks on education across the state of Florida that we have been weathering now for some time. Um, so I'm Really pleased to welcome uh, Dr. Marvin Dunn uh, and to welcome you all tonight to this program. Thank you very much, Eric. And I'm very pleased to be here and to introduce Maya Wiley. She is a nationally respected civil rights attorney and activist who has dedicated her life to the fights for justice, equality, and fairness. While his father was a leader in the civil rights and economic justice movements, and has been a leader in, and she has been a leader inside and outside government. Serving as the first black woman counselor to the mayor of New York City, she helped deliver on civil and immigrant rights. During the tenure, the city saw an expansion of minority women-owned business enterprise contracts. Following her time at City Hall, Wally moved to academia as a faculty member and senior vice president for social justice at the New School University. While there, she chaired the New York City Civil and Civilian Review Board, CCRD. As chair, she led the release of the hold on proceedings against Daniel Patelio, whose illegal chokehold killed Eric Garner. That move led to the CCRB's successful administrative prosecution of Patelio that resulted in his filing. While his tenure at the CCRB was marked by increased case closure rates, increased transparency, and an intense focus on public outreach so that potential victims of police abuse were aware of ways to seek the board's assistance. Yet 2021, while I was a candidate for New York City Mayor, as the Henry Cohen Professor of Public and Urban Policy at the New School, Wiley founded the Digital Equity Laboratory on Universal and Inclusive uh, Broadband. She also served as the legal analyst for NBC News and MSNBC. Early in her career, Wiley worked at the ACL, ACLU and the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund, Inc., where she focused on multiple racial justice issues. She also worked in the Civil Division of the U.S. Attorney of the Southern District of New York. 
Following the September 11th attacks, Wally co-founded the nonprofit Center for Social Inclusion, an organization that focused on transforming structural racism into fair opportunity at the intersection of race and poverty as it relates to education, the digital divide, land use planning, the green economy, and more. Wiley is also a senior advisor on race and poverty at the Open Social Foundation, Open Society Foundations. Wiley earned a BDA from Boston's College and a JD from Columbia Law School. She lives in Brooklyn with her partner in Harlem and their two daughters and cats. You're in for a treat tonight. Thank you very much for being here. Well, uh, thank you, Dr. Dunn. Thank you, Professor Wallenberg. Um, thank you to Jonathan Becker, to Bard, to the students, the alums, everyone who is in this Alt University network. Uh, I will say before I just jump into the topic of tonight's talk and hopefully exchange, um, what an incredible honor it was to participate in the Alt commencement ceremony um, for the graduating class of the new College of Florida because it demonstrated so much about what's important about a community that is a learning community and that really focuses on developing not just the next generations of incredible thinkers and doers, um, but of really full citizens. And I mean that not in the sense of a passport, I mean that in the sense of what it means to participate in a democracy and be a fully evolved human. Um, so I just want to say what a what a pleasure it was. So for me, it was a no brainer to say I would love to come and participate in this critical series, and on a topic that actually was part of forming my my legal career as a, as a civil rights lawyer. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. I did create a PowerPoint. I'm assuming. And so, you know, I will say this because, you know, you're you're an incredible audience. And the, one of the things that's hard about doing these things on Zoom is that if we were together in a room, I'd be able to say, raise your hand if you feel like you have a baseline knowledge of critical race theory. I suspect this is a fairly diverse room in terms of what you know and don't know. So I am going to do a full kind of review and I'm going to share my screen because I did create a PowerPoint. Sorry, give me a moment uh, as I do this, and we'll go to plan. Um, so, you know, we're really talking about critical race theory, but I want to also get um, beyond the attacks and what it really means for our future, because as we know, this attack, well, as I assume many of us know, but this attack is tactical. It's about achieving an end that goes well beyond critical race theory as an educational tool for law students, which is really what it, where it began and what it is. Um, so, you know, what that means, and I'm sorry, I very rarely use my own computer for this. So, um, look, I like to start these things, and this is basically the organization of this talk, which is we're obviously going to talk about what critical race theory is. Um, but I, I I put it in this framework of the power of the better question. You know, our current sitting senator, junior senator from California, Senator LaFonza Butler, uh, who herself is an amazing activist, uh, I, I think always calls us to this concept of the power of the better question. And it's actually significant when we think about education because part of the educational process, in fact, Part of the law school pedagogy, when you think about what it means to do Socratic method, is to ask the better question. And really what critical race theory is at its root is saying, let's ask the better question. But I think part of asking the better question is understanding what does it matter? So what does critical race theory matter? What does it mean? Also, what shall we choose? So I'm going to go through these questions, the power of the better questions, as we're having this discussion. Um, so, look. Sorry, I have to fix my toolbar. So, look, CRT, I wanted to, I thought this would be fun. 
What does the Encyclopedia Britannica say about what CRT is? So critical race theory defined, just a quote, an intellectual and social movement and loosely organized framework of legal analysis based on the premise that race is not a natural, biologically grounded feature of physically distinct subgroups of human beings, but a socially constructed, culturally invented category that is used to oppress and exploit people of color. Now, if you notice, I bolded loosely organized framework of legal analysis. It literally is something, and we'll talk a little bit about the history that is really taught in law schools, focused on how to think about and analyze, including from a legal perspective, what it means to have a society created around these really false notions of, of race, both as biology and then a, a construction that re re resulted not just in intentional racial discrimination, but in all the ways in which it plays out over the generations, over the decades, even when you put laws in place that say you cannot discriminate. I'm going to go through that a bit more, but and I will say this, you know, it, it does say an intellectual and social movement. I have a very, very, very um, rigorous definition of social movement. I would not call a legal framework a social movement. I do think racial justice work has been and is a social movement. This really is a framework of theory, not just for understanding. And well, let's get there. And if you notice, I, I used a photo that says, whatever you are not changing, you are choosing for a reason. All right. So the origins. Let's. I'm going to kind of speed through this. If you have more questions, um, I'm happy to answer them. But, you know, it's really the origins. Uh, professor Derek Bell, who's a law professor ultimately at NYU, not exclusively, but ultimately spent a large uh, percentage of his career at NYU. Uh, Derek Bell was an icon for many of us, and certainly when I was a law student, but he was a civil rights litigator, including at one of my organizations that I work for, the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, uh, Thurgood Marshall, the first black Supreme Court justice founded it, critical to the civil rights movement from the legal standpoint and, the, and from Brown v. Board to a hundred other critical um, cases I could name. Uh, but what Derek Bell did, and, and really the history of, of this was there were two things happening at once. I mean, one, we had a period in time where generally, not, not just critical race theory, there was critical social theory developing in law schools that said we have to understand how the law and our cultural creations around it have, have, have shaped society and why we have to be critical about it and deconstruct it, right? So what we're calling critical race theory was there was already a critical theory that was race neutral. And what happened is civil rights lawyers and academic who often went into academia like, like Professor Derek Bell had a body of research, I, I mean, of, of experience as a litigator, as someone in the trenches working on civil rights, really came to develop his criminal, critical race theory. And I, I want to tell a little bit of the story about what got him there, just because I think it's important to understand these things. He had one of the one of the areas of of litigation he had at the legal defense fund was school desegregation cases very shortly after the supreme court ruling that ldf also won NAACP legal defense fund we call ldf uh, uh as a shorthand at that ldf won with thurgood marshall and brown versus board of education meant a proliferation of lawsuits that the Legal Defense Fund and other civil rights lawyers were bringing across the South to 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 enforce essentially this this new this new Supreme Court precedent that said yeah yeah it's unconstitutional but that's not self activating it's not like suddenly the South went oh yeah okay it's wrong now we won't do it anymore that's not how it works right uh, you have to fight to implement and so that meant lawsuits and there was this, there was a community. Lost him. I won't go into all the details, but the community wasn't actually demanding school integration. In fact, it was a community, a black community, historically black community, um, that, that had a, 
It's a school that it was very proud that it created, considered it quality education. And actually the state, uh, and this was in Mississippi, was trying to close it down. And what the community contacted the Legal Defense Fund to say, we want you to help fight to keep our school, to get our school reopened. Um, but they wanted it to stay a community school, which by definition meant a segregated black school. Now, LDF and, and came in and said, well, we won't do that, but we will litigate it to fight to reopen it as an integrated school and demand that it be integrated. And the community ultimately agreed, and years go by in litigation, and finally they win, and all kinds of horrible things happen, like the bombing of the homes of uh, the named plaintiff, uh, the attempted bombing of a family member of the named plaintiff, horrific things and typical things, acts of violence that we saw across the South in demanding integrated schools. And the irony, according to Derek Bell, was not only that was the community calling and asking for help to reopen their school, not asking for help to integrate it, but that in the process of integrating, the, the costs were very high. And ultimately, when the school was reopened, um, there were all kinds of issues around quality of education that's, that came out of that. But I say that because as he developed his thinking and feelings and emotions and observations, he started to question whether or not lawyers were thinking construct critically enough about race and what it meant, uh, how society was structured and whether society would in fact ever not be racist. And he actually became a founder of the of critical race theory uh, and, and, and literally was the source of the origins as he started to write some really important books about it. I say this because now this is not to say that all critical race theorists, black critical race theorists, agreed with his negativity about racism in America, but certainly agreed. So there's not that it's it's not that the legal analysis itself means there's not a diversity of viewpoint. I was a law student when critical race theory was really coming into its full bloom. Um, and there was real debate amongst, including black faculty. Critical race theorists were not always not only black; they're also Latino. Um, Richard Delgado. Uh, there are others. So there, there. It is not only, but it certainly is. Its origins were the black civil rights uh, legal scholars, um, but it and and really critiquing race around blackness and anti-blackness and how it was constructed into society. But he literally started posing that, you know, so the U.S. is inherently racist and going to remain inherently racist no matter what we, we do. And he wasn't suggesting doing nothing, by the way, but it was very, very negative, And that was debated. Not all critical race theorists were, were as negative or became anti-integrationists in a way that he became. But I say all that just to say we talk about critical race theory and you would think there is... Um, uh, a kind of universality of viewpoint within critical race theory. And like anything, whether it's academic or just out in the real world, got different viewpoints within it. Um, but I say that because it then brings us to, okay, so the theory is race is baked into a society. It's a social construct. It's a legal construct. It perpetuates itself. But why does it matter? Why do we need this thing called critical race theory? Again, Encyclopedia Britannica, because I just find it interesting, um, but also not in inaccurate. Critical race theorists are generally dedicated to applying their understanding of the institutional or structural nature of racism to the concrete, if distant, goal of eliminating all race-based and other unjust hierarchies. All that means is what it matters is how do we understand how we've constructed race in America? And how do we undo it so that we don't have racial constructs where some racial groups are at the bottom of the ladder and some racial groups, specifically white, are at the top of the ladder? How do we change that? Because our aspirations and our constitutional ideal, not, not always the way it's interpreted, not always the way the founders intended it, 
But certainly the ideal, I think, would be quality, uh, equal opportunity, a lot of these va- freedoms, a lot of things that uh, that I think we would generally agree on as values uh, that the U.S. holds, but we don't agree on how to hold them and what it looks like to construct a society where we actually see that as an outcome. So that's all the why it matters. That's why critical race theorists created critical race theory was to figure out and understand and consider what it what is happening institutionally that means structurally critical point here critical race theory posits it don't matter if you are a good-hearted person that believes all races are equal and should have equal opportunity because of the way things work you can still be perpetuating racial inequality. And let me just give you a really practical kind of structural, institutional structural analysis that is one that I've used a million times in teaching, um, in advocacy. But how do we create the middle class in America? If I asked you that, see, if we were in person, I'd make you call and respond. But if I ask you that, you know, uh, a number of people, we made decisions coming out of the Great Depression to invest in home ownership. The government, national government at one point, Veterans Administration was underwriting half of all U.S. mortgage, homeowner mortgages. That's how we actually created home ownership, which created equity, assets, wealth in the growth of the value of the home. That helped create a middle class. That wasn't even the first one. The first one, the first actually pillar of the New Deal was the Social Security Act of 1935. Now, the Social Security Act of 1935, the face of home mortgage lending guaranteed by the federal government for all these returning veterans, I could name other programs, but they were created race neutrally. They said nothing explicitly in eligibility for Social Security, which, remember, is not only retirement savings. It was the first time there were disability benefits if you were disabled and lost your job, unemployment benefits, things that helped you make ends meet, uh, things that your family had to find the money in their own pockets to take to take care of, uh, no matter how much they were struggling to care for a family member. That was that burden was eased. And that created more more dollars that families could spend, including buying a home and getting that federal home mortgage guarantee to do it. But here's the thing. It discriminated, and it, in fact, was targeted to discriminate in particular against black people, not only because, like all things, it doesn't only harm one racial group whenever we do these race-neutral exclusions, but the eligibility criteria was quite said, oh, yeah, 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 everyone is eligible except domestic workers and farm labor. Well, in 1935, where do you think most Black people lived in this country? The South. You know, we were, so remember, we were still in the throes of what was beginning as the Great Migration, so we still had a vast majority of the South, in the South, as farm labor and domestics. So the mere act of making them ineligible, which is, was actually an explicit political deal to get the Dixiecrats on board with New Deal legislation, was intended to make sure Black people didn't benefit. Now, did that hurt white people? It did. There were there was white farm labor. There were some white people who were domestics. It just didn't hurt white people as an entire racial category in quite the way because of racism, because of slavery, because of Jim Crow racism, segregation in the South, meant literally like, I think, 65%, I may be getting the percentage wrong, an incredibly high percentage of Blacks in the South were not eligible for Social Security. The military discriminated against uh, Black people even joining up, remember, in World War II. That's why we talk about the Tuskegee Airmen and what they had to go through just to serve the country. Because they were ineligible, like many of these programs were targeted to veterans, which meant 
very few black people got the benefits of these programs because they were discriminated against in even entering military service. I could go on, I'm not going to, but that's an example of saying, well, why do we see more black people di disproportionately poor, disproportionately segregated, uh, huge racial wealth gaps in this country? Um, some analysis by some said for, you could you could attribute over 40% of the racial wealth gap between black and white to this legacy of not investing in home ownership in the black community. It's a higher percentage even than education uh, because asset wealth is such a big part of wealth. So what this analysis ha helps you do is understand why do we see disproportionate poverty today? that we can identify by race. And by the way, we can do this for Latinos. We can do this for Native American. This is a theory and a way of thinking and critically about race. Um, it helps us actually understand white poverty in many instances, but it also helps us understand how white poverty looks different from say black poverty or Native American poverty because there were certain race types of racial privileging even in the impoverishment, even in structures of economy that didn't serve white people, and also help become some of those race wedges and why we see, for example, one of my favorite twisted stories was when I was a young lawyer at the ACLU and we were working to create an, 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 an education equity lawsuit in Louisiana and this former grand dragon of the KKK, David Duke, was running for governor of Louisiana. And one of his promises, this great white supremacist, literal white supremacist, not figurative, not being hyperbolic, he literally was the grand dragon of the Ku Klux Klan running for governor. Key pillar of his platform where he generally was not talking about race. So he wasn't running overtly as a white supremacist, but what he said is, we're going to end welfare. Now, journalists, when I'll never forget this because I, I was sitting in a hotel room because we were working on this case, watching the evening news, evening news goes to a welfare line and all these whites, Louisiana, you know how many poor white people in Louisiana? A whole lot. In fact, most people who are poor are actually white in number. So this line of welfare recipients most welfare recipients, largest number, not percentages, not proportionality, but number is white, standing in a line. And my father, part of his economic justice work was organizing women on welfare for fair welfare benefits and a guaranteed minimum income. So I'm fascinated by this. So he, this line, 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 and the journalist is going through saying, are you going to support David Duke or or the other guy? And the, the literally, the, this woman says, white woman standing in the welfare line says, well, I'm supporting David Duke. And of course, the journalist says, well, but he says he's going to eliminate welfare. So why are you supporting him? And she says, because of all those lazy people who weren't work on welfare. And what she, of course, meant was black people. And she didn't see herself in the same way or in the same place as black people. And that's part of what that hierarchy and stratification does, where you can kind of see this denial, even if folks who are in the same boat on one level, struggling and being a welfare assist, but somehow not seeing themselves in the same social construct. That's kind of the work, the psychological and cultural work that some of these structures and institutional Policymaking, decision making frameworks have created that then have very real resonance in the daily in our in our daily world and still do. Uh, but I'm just saying this is why critical race theory matters is because it how it helps us understand why even when we have and I will say it a majority of Americans will say racism is wrong, and yet we perpetuate racial un injustice and hierarchy. So I love this because actually one of the um, one of the critical thinkers in critical race theory is uh, Professor Kimberly Crenshaw, who is uh, you know I think also one of the she literally was one of the students at the feet of Derrick Bell who really helped because it, it was a lot of those early originators of critical race theory were also his students 
formulating and expanding this. And, you know, I think she does such a good job of embodying this, why does it matter? And she took it a step further to name intersectionality, uh, a word I think many of us are familiar with probably on this Zoom, but how critical race theory helps us understand inter- how we're, how it shapes gender, how it shapes poverty, how uh, all these things are interrelated. Um, and including for some of us embodied in who we are, uh, is we're not just one of these single things. And th- and these institutional dynamics impact all of us. Just think trans women of color. Just think trans black women and the disproportionate violence of trans black women. Too many, too much violence against transgender people of any race or 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 any gender identity in terms of their trans identity. And nonetheless, the disproportionate amount of de- homicide is black trans women. That's part of an intersectional analysis. But here's the thing. The what doesn't matter, she says so well. It is effectively an embodiment. She's talking about what, what critical race theory really is and why it matters. It's effectively an embodiment of what I call racial literacy. I just, I bolded that because I love it so much, right? Racial literacy, because who thinks we should be illiterate? bad thing to be illiterate in a society and in a society so identified with developing racial hierarchy, racial literacy makes sense. And that's not to exclude any racial group. It's just to say, but we have to understand how all this is playing out across groups, across identities and at intersectional identities. How do we read the world? How do we understand the relationship between its history? We frame it that way, not simply as a way of making history We'll get to meaning, making history, and showing, for example, how segregated neighborhoods were the product of federal policy that continues to create material differences in wealth. I gave some of those examples. And in health, health disparity, a big example of this to this day, it's important to understand the history of it to do something about it. If we don't understand it, if we're not willing to look at it, if we're not willing to understand where are we, why do things look the way they look, how did we get here, why are we still here, even if we have a lot of people who agree that it's wrong, how can we stay here, how come this race wealth gap continues, how come segregation is on the rise, how come we still don't have quality schools, and how come, how come, how come? Well, it's because we're not doing enough racial literacy, which is part of what critical race theory is about. And in fact, it's also about communication. She doesn't say it here, although this, she's getting at it with kind of how do we understand the world. But she's also been an incredible um, academic who relates to the real world. And how do we talk about it with folks who aren't in law school, who aren't having a, just elite conversations, who come at this from different parts of society? And part of what she does, I think, so well is help say, how do we talk about it? And one of the things that Derek Bell, Professor Derek Bell, did brilliantly, and if if, if you want to read a great example of this, this is a depressing one because he's on the negative side of the theory that doesn't exactly espouse a lot of hope. I'm not on the negative side of the theory. I, I actually disagreed with him on some of his pessimism, um, but not with ha- his incredible anal- analytic skills. But one of the things he did so well is he has a book called Faces at the Bottom of the Well. I was in law school and, in fact, went to um, a book book reading that he did at our law school when he wrote it. And one of the things that critical race theorists did was they would use allegory, storytelling, kind of almost um, almost like fantasy fiction, but to try to help people be able to re- relate to it. And one of the, one of the th- tools he used in this book is he wanted to explain why he believes that fundamentally we're a racist society that um, that in the right conditions will return to the racism, including potentially slavery, if we don't, if we aren't willing to face it, racism down. And the way he does that is he uses this allegory story, fictional, uh, about aliens coming to Earth, Earth being starved for petroleum, for gas, for 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 fossil fuels. He did this, by the way, so precious. This was in the this was in the eighties, <laughs> and that. But because we were so dependent on it as a society, we were willing to do anything to get their supply. 
And they said, we will give it to you in exchange for black slaves. And so he uses this to talk about how society goes through this whole debate about, and then ultimately recreates black slavery to give to aliens to get fossil fuels. So, but I, I use that example because it was just a way of the critical race theory. Also, critical race theorists were attacked because they would use these communication strategies of storytelling, of trying to paint either their personal personal pictures of how it played out in their lives, um, but also uh, at those kinds of um, kind of fictional allegories to kind of explain what I think today we've seen with Trumpism. Uh, uh, a lot of people would have never thought you could get a misogynist, racist uh, candidate running for political office and win the presidency that way. Uh, but yeah, yeah, we did that. Um, so, uh, but but I want to just suggest this because we talk about history, you know, as 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 Professor Crenshaw says, we we have to understand history and understand where we are today. And this is just a little, 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 right? You know, when you think about what was happening in the South, and this is 1965, right? So, confed this this is this is in um, the Selma to Montgomery march, and you have these counter protesters jeering the marchers, right? Clearly, Confederate flag. Um, Regular folks who are white supremacists, right? Whether they're in a group or not, is that their ideology and their socialization is whites are superior and it's okay to treat blacks as subhuman. And this uh, separate picture, Amelia Boynton, who was one of the marchers in the march, um, who had been beaten unconscious by state troopers, by state troopers. There's another photo I didn't use with all the state troopers sitting on a wall with their Confederate flag as marchers were marching by. Um, so the very, uh, the state, right? This, in the sense of this embodiment, the state was part of the control structure that said, you can't even protest for your civil rights. We all know this history, right? Everybody agrees this is why we lionize Martin Luther King, who was on that march, or John Lewis, who was on that march, who was beaten so badly on the Edmund Pettus Bridge. This is a history we all know, we all agree. And now we're in, in this post-race society, I would say, and post-fact, where we say, yes, but that was then, and then we had civil rights in the 1965 Civil Rights Act of 1965, so now we're done. Yeah, yes. Um, this was also, but we talk of, well, I always talked about as a Southern problem, not as a national problem. My parents were civil rights activists in the North, and part of why was they wanted to show is just as bad in the North. They were organizing for Congress on Racial Equality in Syracuse. This was the North. So 1966, Northwest Chicago, National States Rights Party. Sounds pretty Southern and Confederate, doesn't it? Uh, Queens, 1965. My father was at the Congress on Racial Equality as the number two, as the National uh, De Associate Director for James Farmer. When this, when when they were marching at the World's Fair in Queens, New York, these were the counter protesters. I am a Jim. I am Jim Crow, and I shall live forever. This is in New York. Okay, so we've we erase that often in in our popular understanding. Um, but let's ju juxtapose this now and bring this forward. So we have George Floyd is killed in 2020. Not the first I can't breathe, right? Remember, Eric Garner happens in 2014, and summer of 2014, he's the first I can't breathe as a hashtag. Uh, then there's George Floyd in 2020, Black Lives Matter protest. I'm using this photo of police for the control um, image. But then we start to have this wokeness, this anti-wokeness debate, right? After 2020, because crime rates start to rise. Remember, remember Derek Bell's allegory about needing fossil fuels when aliens come to offer it what we're willing to do. We have Black Lives Matter, all of these amazing, I was amazed, I was in some of these marches in New York, 60 year old white folks standing, clapping pans, demanding systemic talking about systemic racism. I spent a career talking about systemic and structural racism. And now it's mainstream. It's on cable news. I'm on cable news being asked about structural racism. <laughs> I'm. This is a world I'm like, wow. Um, wow. Right. 
But very quickly, we start to attack wokeness and we start to see the attack on wokeness. Some of the counter protesting, what happened to all lives matter, all lives. But at diversity is our shape. We're getting then to the CRT, critical race theory protests start. Critical race theory is racist. Racist. An analysis, it says, let's just look at where people are. Let's look at facts. Let's look at data. Let's look at policy and what policy produced. Let's look at how it's structured and let's try to understand. That's racist? Now, the debate is the attack on critical race theory. Is it a backlash? Meaning, because some people describe it as a backlash. So you have you have George Floyd, you have these massive global, not even just national, global protests for Black Lives Matter, for systemic, ending systemic racism, um, for opening up a debate about but about so many things, critical things, not only policing, but also critically policing. Uh, you start hearing demands for resources that are going to policing and criminal justice to go to things like mental health, uh, reducing class size, you know, creating different ways to solve societal problems that we haven't invested in, uh, rather than investing in the control mechanisms. But but COVID hits. I mean, we're in COVID. Crime rates climb because people are hungry and starving. Um, some of that some of that violence that rises is also, um, frankly, mental health issues. Um, won't say a lot about this. Or is it a strategy? Is it an intentional strategy? Guess where I'm going with this? So Chris Rufo, I think the new college folks know who Chris Rufo is. Um, but Chris Rufo, and remember Chris Rufo, um, his claim to fame begins, begins as a guy who ran for office in the Northwest um, works for government and is sitting in, and because it's COVID, is sitting in a Zoom um, diversity training, diversity inclusion training that government is doing for its employees. And he's listening to this language that is typical, you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion language that talks about white discomfort with race and um, how to address the discomfort and have the conversation. He sees an op. He's a conservative already. Interestingly, got there as someone who didn't start as a conservative, but as he and his he was a journalist and becomes conservative because he's actually as he's doing coverage of poverty, decides that black people are poor because um, there's a problem with them, not because. We don't have jobs that pay or schools that help people get good paying jobs uh, or a whole bunch of other things that critical race theory would point to to say why we see difficulty. We, we construct uh, and we constructed jobs very far from segregated black communities with no investments in public transit and an inability to get to the jobs. That's a critical race theory type analysis. He didn't see the structure and the institutional and the policy. He just saw people and decided it was their fault because he didn't understand what he was saying because he was not racially literate. But he becomes conservative and he uses it. But as a, he sees an opportunity and senses an opportunity, so he takes public and becomes the whistleblower on this diversity, equity, inclusion program, um, completely takes it out of context takes its language out of context, and it becomes a phenomenon and a rallying cry. But but then as he's looking at the footnotes, he's, he starts doing all the research on these DE&I programs as he's whistleblown and to expand it, seeing the organizing opportunity of a communications campaign strategy to move right-wing ideology, he starts realizing there are two books that he's seen constantly in the footnotes as the resources for this, and it's uh, Ibram X. Kendi, How to Be an Anti-Racist, and Robin DiAngelo, White Fragility, Why It's So Hard for White People to Talk About Racism. Now, these aren't, they are not in, 
the, but they're coming out of a, a kind of a a framework that because and then in these books he's seeing Derek Bell and Kim Crenshaw cited in those footnotes. So it gets him to critical race theory and he sees the opportunity to basically call it racism against and, and, a, and a divisive strategy and all the rest. So I say this because he saw he was already um, conservative. He had already run for political office to advance his conservative ideology, lost, um, angry and pillory before his, because he was really organized by the left, uh, really attacking him because of his views. But he also has his, has his finger on a pulse point he thinks he can, he can take advantage of and did it brilliantly. So what does it mean? So I say that to say it is a strat is a tactic that blew into a strategy uh, that um, that has become anti wokeness. So remember, so it's diversity. It's it's not only CRT. It's so it's anything that tries to address racism. So it's diversity, equity, and inc inclusion programs. It's critical race theory. It's gender studies. It's saying gay. It's right. It, it's book bans. Like we have to ban all these books that are trying to like groom our children into transgender people. It's um, it's DeSantis seeing the opportunity to take. And this is this is the 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 conservative dollars start flowing. If I asked you how many of you heard about um, heard of Leonard Leo, I don't know how many of you would raise your hands. Um, many who do know him know about his funding, Federalist Society, the right-wing conservatives that ensured that we have a Supreme Court and that Donald Trump would have the list of judges to appoint, including to the Supreme Court, to reverse Roe v. Wade, among other things. Um, also, Leonard Leo is, but Leonard Leo has $1.6 billion, and he has used that to fund the attack Chris Rufo and the attack on CRT to fund Moms for Liberty, the book banners, to fund Ed Bloom, who is the one who brought the anti-affirmative action cases, who has also been an anti-voting rights litigator, who is now bringing the lawsuits to say that even though black women only get 1% of venture capital dollars, he picks us really wonderful literal little and I say little because they don't have a lot of resources, a uh, black women's organization called the Fearless Fund uh, that dedicates, raises resources for venture capital for black women entrepreneurs because black women entrepreneurs only get 1% uh, venture capital dollars, even though black women are disproportionately starting small businesses. When you look at the small business numbers, they're disproportionately women of color, immigrant women and black women. But I'm saying that because what they're, going after is dismantling everything that becomes racial equity work and everything and connected to that. So colorblindness is their goal. Racism, don't care. Intersectionality, you know, so I'm saying these are all terms that we think about because critical race th theory is also about intersectionality, but they're using the war on woke. They're using the attack on critical race theory and other things. And it's all the same money. It's a larger strategy. But they're also using it to go after gender, gender identity, gender studies programs. And I think when we talk about new, this part of why it was like the perfect conversation for this group. It's because when we see what the governor of Florida did to New College, it was all part of that not just the vision for dismantling an education programs that would create racial literacy, gender literacy, gender identity literacy. It's why we ban, they're banning books. They want to undermine the literacy. And it's fundamentally literacy and it's about freedom, freedom to be who we are, freedom to vote, um, the ways we actually engage in how to become an America that lives up to our, the ideals that we largely say we have. Um, so the attack on CRT really means an attack on literacy and literacy in its most fundamental democratic way, uh, which is how to be a full participating human 
able to be who we are, but be able to contribute to understanding why we are where we are and what we do about it. That's why it matters. So when we talk about disparities and why we have racial disparities, gender disparities, those intersectional disparities that I mentioned, like trans women of color, that any of these disparities, it is they are telling us how our institutions are working. They are symptoms of what critical race theory, critical theories are trying to get us to see and understand so we can have a different discussion about what we need to do and th what it means. They don't want us to have the discussion, let alone the power and ability, like through voting rights and the ability to use our voices to decide who leads us or to design curriculum and have curriculum or to read books or to protest that they don't want that because it prevents them from having the dominant ideology and preserving not just their worldview, but the structure of an unequal society that for whatever reason, they're, which I think is power, they're deeply invested in. So here are the states. So if you look at critical race theory bans, we're seeing these, the green states are where some form of critical race theory ban has been adopted into law. The yellow states um, are, are the um, uh, approved, they may mean they passed, but they got vetoed or overturned in court. And the purple is where they proposed or tried. The seven states is where there's been not even an attempt to ban. And as you can see, very, very few states where there's not an attempt. This is a well-funded, concerted strategy. We could, If I overlaid this with the attack on voting rights, voter suppression laws, gerrymandering, book banning, um, don't say gay laws, we would have, and we have done some of this mapping at the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights, we're going to see many of the same states. We're going to see overlap uh, because these things are interconnected, intentional, organized, and it's a strategy. So, but what does this mean for us? Because remember that part of critical race theory is, and part of the problem, the, 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 the um, power of the better question is, what shall we choose? What shall we choose? One of the reasons it was such a pleasure, but to be at the, the new alt commencement and all that this university, this alt university represents is, we who believe in freedom shall not rest. And y'all have not rested. <laughs> the students were not resting or accepting. They were resisting with joy. They are resisting with joy. You are resisting with joy. I'm sharing this release that includes my coalition, um, the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights, but also many of our member groups, and then folks who aren't our member groups, just to say, you know, there's a campaign on endorsing freedom to learn uh, and on endorsing not just freedom to learn. It is all of us. So this is also a coalitional effort. It's not just new college. And when I said that the commencement, I meant new college students standing up to what was happening at new college was standing up for more than new college students, was standing up for we who believe in freedom, and we shall not rest. And here's the other thing, and this is part of my point about I'm not pessimistic. I believe in the possibility of a different future and of an America that lives up to its ideals. Um, but one of the reasons is when we think about the generation that is the, the students at the commencement that I was so privileged to participate in, is that actually just since 2020, there are seven to nine million more voters who are Gen Z. And guess what's the most diverse and the most freedom-loving and dem democracy-loving generation that we have in this country? It's Gen Z. And when you add them with millennials, that it's also very much in favor of freedom, of democracy, of racial literacy, of gender literacy, of freedom to have an abortion or choose 
whatever our gender identities are. It's also millennials. This is why they have to rig the rules and manipulate fear because we are the majority. And Gen Z and millennials in particular, and Gen Z in particular, if we can convince Gen Z to vote fully, Gen Z would own the agenda. Gen Z would decide who's in office. Gen Z would decide what laws pass in states and what doesn't. Gen Z would do that. So I'm saying that they can only win by cheating. We win by not just believing in our collective freedom. We win because we work together and because we insist on literacy, all of our literacy, and we're not afraid of it. So I will stop there. And stop my screen share and open it up for discussion. I thank thank you for that uh, wonderful talk. I uh, one second a camera on. Okay, that was just absolutely ex exquisite. Thank you so much uh, for the for your talk. I do have just a couple of questions, if, if you don't mind. Where do you think America is now on on CRT? Uh, has there been a movement of the needle, say, say over the last uh, immediate two, three, four years on this subject? Yeah, you said I mean, it, that. It, it, it's a it's a great question, um, Doctor Dunn. I think the short answer is um, yes. The needle has moved. And I'll give you, we do a civil rights monitor poll. Uh, we did one last year. We did it this year so that we can see the trend lines. Now we didn't, we didn't test critical race theory, critical race theory, because that's playing on their turf, right? They, they took it, they made wokeness toxic. They made critical race theory toxic. Um, even though it's not, we, the, you know, I would say the movement made the mistake of responding on their terrain, meaning trying to describe what? No, 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 you're wrong. This is what critical race theory is. Right. That, 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 not, not that we were wrong about y'all not, y'all not even getting it right. Um, but because they were so good at manipulating emotion and particularly emotion coming out of COVID, it's not, the point really wasn't critical race theory, right? The, 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 the point is about being an inclusive democracy. Uh, where we all belong, where we can learn our histories, where we share our histories, where we... So I think we've seen the needle move a lot on really what is underneath it, which is pluralism, uh, a diverse society, and support for we should be able to learn our history. We should be able to read books. So I'll say two things. We What we have seen is uh, there's a huge, 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 huge number of Americans who are deeply concerned about democracy, uh, and we talk about this in election cycle as uh, deeply concerned about the economy. Yeah, deeply concerned about the economy and making ends meet. But we see democracy as one of the top two issues with the economy and within democracy. And it's gone up. There, it's gone up six percentage points since last year. So even as we've gotten farther from September, um, from January 6th insurrection, so it wasn't just a blip is my point about the insurrection. Uh, and it's not, it, it includes Dobbs and, and overruling Roe v. Wade, but it includes book banning. It includes all the attacks, voting rights attacks. So what we've seen is when it comes down to pluralism versus anti-wokeness, 58% of folks in our poll were very much saying we got to do pluralism, not anti-wokeness. 37% were in the anti-wokeness category, which is where the attack on CRT lives, the book bans live, the, you know, all of that stuff lives. The dip, the thing we have to work on. So we got the numbers. The difference is they have a minority, but they have more intensity about it. So part of what we need to do next is recognize the dial is moving. It's because we're all working to move it. It's that it didn't happen automatically. But we've got more work to do to get our enthusiasm up about about it. And that's because they have more enthusiasm, which is why their lesser numbers have more impact. They also have more money, but they've always had more money than us. But we've still won because we have more people. So that's why I also point to the Gen Z and the millennials. We got to get 
us and especially these generations much more fired up about it and showing up and making noise about it, including at the polls. Mike, if, if you were advising the mayor of the city of New York today about the uh, immigrants coming in flooding the city and having to come up with uh, some policy, recognizing that some of the my animosity about this is racially based, what would you advise the mayor of New York City today to do about the flood of immigrants? Oh, well, you mean besides not committing any crimes? Um, <laughs> no, <Not> that's... <laughs> All right. Um, well, 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 no, no. I, well, I think that's, first of all, he had talked differently about it. You know, wh- one of the things we see in our poll, uh, one of the problems with what happened in New York City, and, other, it, and not true of other cities, right? Um, but in New York City, where the language became us, them, um, uh, us, them language kind of saying we can't handle, you know, just kind of attacking the immigrants ra- and migrants rather than recognizing that we have a real prop set of problems we have to solve and and we have to take care of people to solve them and they're they're going to be things that we're going to have to do together to solve them and um and i think rather than language of division um there were real questions so for example uh really thinking about housing policy and the right to shelter uh, that's one of the ways people got pitted against each other was that we have a huge homeless population in the city with and when and when migrants came in, then it became, well, now we will lose shelter space and they will get right. So part of the important thing to do as a city is to say, no, 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 no. We're going to figure out a way to solve the crisis of homelessness. Uh, we, and I, and the immediate thing was to fight for the right to work because part of what happened is migrants came in and couldn't work, um, which meant they also couldn't become more self-sufficient. Um, and that was something that the city did not, and or the state for that matter, did not jump on top of fast enough. So, But I think if we're not talking about these real problems differently, they become dividers rather than, rather than ways of seeing we have shared problems. Um, and we really actually have to work together on the, on the solutions. Thank you. I'll defer. I'm sure others have questions, but thank you for your response. Thank you. Hey, thanks so much for that, Dr. Dunn and, and uh, Maya Wiley. That was fantastic. Uh, we appreciate the tutorial on critical race theory and taking us through that. It's extremely helpful um, with all of the hyperbole and all of the talk about critical race theory where there's no actual content of what people mean by that um, from the right. I think that is um, just what we needed. And I wish some of these politicians a little looking at a little less time speaking. Uh, we might be in a better place for it. Uh, I'm going to go ahead. There are a few questions that have popped up here. So if it's all right, I'm going to go ahead and read one of them. Um, in regards to that slide that you put up on the, the legislation that was that has been passed, especially, uh, well, in many states against critical race theory, there's been some cases where there's been pushback, of course, um, and some legal victories around there. Um, So uh, one person writes here, there's a legal battle over what can be taught. Can you speak to successful legal strategies to defend teaching about race, both in schools and universities? What has been most successful? And I might just add what has been least successful. Can you can you talk a little bit about the, those strategies? Yeah. Well, I mean, first, just to say um, each of these state laws are different. So some are more vulnerable because it depends on how they're written, right? I mean, really savvy lawmakers try to, you know, um, cast it in ways that are more easily protected. And remember, we have a, one of the problems we have in this country is we don't have a constitutional right to education. People forget that. Uh, the civil rights community had litigated to try to establish the Constitution included, should be read to include a constitutional right to education. It doesn't. So when we're looking at these state laws, it's both how are they written, but it's also what laws govern, what the state constitutions say. So it can be a very complex question because it can vary very much state to state. I would say, so in some instances in F- Florida, uh, you know, and particularly as we've seen, um, got has gotten beaten back a bit on some of its language, right? 
Um, so it it is it is it is um, so it's a hard question to answer just because it varies so much. But I would say, you know, having the ability to look at both state constitutional provisions, how the laws are written, um, create that opportunity. There's the federal federal statute allows the Department of Justice to also come and look, which it has done in a few instances, to say. We think you're violating federal civil rights law that says if you got federal dollars, you can't discriminate based on race. So in some instances, that's been a, they've been able to utilize that on sh- launching investigations about whether there's actually a race discriminatory impact to some of these laws. Um, but I actually think that one of the, the things we have to do is think very deeply about strategy, because if you remember, you know, the college board, you all remember this because it was Florida's be you know, sorry, Florida, we're not leaving you. We're not abandoning you. We know it should be a purple state. It is a purple state. We have to be able to have these debates in Florida. Um, But that, 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 that uh, when Ron DeSantis, um, you know, used the power of the state to bully the college board around, around its AP African-American studies curriculum, right? The college board is has I mean it's incredible influencer about what curricula is available, um, and I think some of the organizing around pushing and pressuring the college board that's been happening around how they're designing and offering curricula, and how there's a counterweight to what curricula in that instance it was AP history African American history. Um, um, and how we organize around the attacks, like when Florida said, basically, you're required to teach kids that slavery wasn't so bad, and actually they benefited from it, right? I mean, that's the kind of thing that requires an organizing strategy, and um, and that is as important as a litigating strategy. And that's part of why I'm pointing to the power of Gen Z and millennials, who I think are deeply, deeply troubled by these things. But if we can get folks to really recognize what a difference they make by participating, both in the policy debate and organizing, but also in showing up the polls saying, we're not going to vote for candidates who aren't supporting freedom of education, uh, learning history, being able to learn African-American history, gender studies, all of the things that are under attack, uh, um, reversing book bans, that, um, that is a huge power that's even more powerful than litigation. And that doesn't mean we shouldn't also do litigation because that's often a useful part of that strategy. But I just think that is such an incredible long game key thing to recognize our power to just change it through the through the bully pulpit we have at the polls. Thank you for that. I I wonder if we might dig down on that a little bit more. We had a, a follow up question from somebody here um, saying, "Let me get to it." Um, how do educators continue to help students think for themselves in an environment that is closing this door? Um, and I wonder if we might hear from you to, you know, you, that's certainly what you're saying with that answer, but yeah. you might say a little bit more about what you're doing when you teach. And, and maybe we might bring Dr. Dunn in to say a, a word, you know, how he might respond to that as well. Yeah, and I will. Say, you, yeah. I, I will. I, I will. I will. I will own my privilege of having been a faculty member at the new school, which is like new college, and uh, and also old new college, <laughs> not new new college, and um, and I'm also the Joseph Frau professor uh, at the University of the District of Columbia School of Law, which is a social justice law school. So I get the privilege of that, and it's, it's been tough. Like I've talked to a lot of teachers and faculty members who, uh, some of whom have been fired uh, for for doing it, Professor Wallenberg. Um, but also, uh, and a, particularly in the K through 12 setting where it, pe- teachers have felt very vulnerable. One of the things that I think is really important is that the uh, education ed- educators unions, the um, AFT and the NEA, both of which are member organizations to our civil rights coalition, have a freedom to learn campaign. And Florida was one of our states for the freedom to learn campaign. But part of what that is doing is not is supporting educators, supporting librarians, 
uh, and figuring out how to and doing a lot of parent organizing. You know, we, we forget that there's particularly in K through 12, having parents demand is actually a critical protection tool for teachers and faculty members who are doing the teaching. So the, the, the organizing of parents and, and, um, uh, it, it is an incredibly important part of both helping, uh, educators be protected. But also a lot in a lot of those instances, finding the tools to teach that stay within to the extent there's an actual legal boundary that can stay within the frame of the boundary. Because depending on again, that very state to state, but I can tell you, I can tell you how I would bring it in as a matter of history and argue that it was consistent with the law. But again, the only thing that really protects is if there's also organizing from the community around the school, the administration, the faculty, the librarian. Um, there's a great story about a librarian who, in a very conservative um, town, rural town in Louisiana, who just thought the book banning was insane. And she just organized the community around how insane it was. And they and it was conservative ideologically, the community. And she she was able to beat it back by saying, this is just not freedom. And people got it. So I just think there's a lot more opportunity than we know if we're really willing to do the organizing and then protect people and create that organizing support container, just both on the how, but also then on the prote the political protection, the small p political protection it really matters. I'll but if you're asking, yeah, I can just make sure you all have, but the freedom to learn campaign you actually have a little bit of eye up here, but there's a whole campaign. It's a national campaign. And the more people we can get engaged in it um, and then real solutions for kids and communities. But all of that includes like making sure kids are learning, including their history. And uh, and my way of making sure that kids are learning is to take them to the bloody ground, take them to places where these things happened, yeah. to organize at the community level, uh, to raise the money to take people to relive their history. These communities all over the country, north and south, east and west, they know where these things happen yep. in their communities. Organize as we did, as we're doing in Florida, and take your kids, take their parents and grandparents and teachers to these places and have them experience a transformational uh, e event that they will remember the rest of their lives. That's how we're passing on these stories in Florida. I could go on and on about how which particular stories we are attacking, but I'll, I'll say this to you. We just finished our sixth Teach the Truth tour to places in Florida where racial violence took place. And we're planning more for the next uh, few weeks. And we cannot accommodate the number of people and the, no and the number of institutions, churches, and schools that would like to be involved in what we're doing to take people at no cost to them. We raise the money to pay for an overnight trip to take people around the state of Florida to these places. And I think it's making an impact. I mean, you take a bus load of 55 people to Rosewood with cameras, they take a video and they send it all over the world to their friends. We're getting the word out about these stories and saving them through taking people there with cameras who can can pass on these stories well beyond uh, what can be done by the folks who actually walk that good ground. Mm -hmm. I love that. That's so important. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thank you both for that. Um, Maybe just shifting uh, gears a little bit here. I was rewatching um, the conversation between Judith Butler and Masha Gessen and Libby Harity from New College on the attack on gender studies, thinking about this attack on critical race theory, how they really have gone hand in hand, um, especially in Florida, especially in New College. Um, and they had an interesting kind of discussion. You you alluded to this, that there are real debates within gender studies, that the people who are attacking it have no sense of the kind of complicated and interesting and important discussions that are happening about why we study gender, why we have to think about gender, why it's important to think about gender. Um, and I'm wondering if you can maybe say something about um, those discussions in critical race theory, or even just thinking about the discussions of institutionalized racism in this country, um, I know when I teach, you know, when I'm teaching U.S. history, I teach Carol Anderson in White Rage, but I also teach Ira Katz Nelson when affirmative action was white, right? And I teach 
Craig Stephen Wilder on Coven, uh, Covenant with Color. And they have real interesting discussions and they don't all say the same thing. Um, some of that is the most interesting discussions for students to have to really think critically. So I'm just wondering if you might say a word on some of the debates and the discussions or an interesting debate or discussion that happens that you think is important to highlight some of that history. And well, yeah, you- yeah. And, and I think a really great example, and I did, I did see um, a, a question in the chat around the question of capitalism. And I think that's like one of the examples, for instance, like does critical race theory, what th- there are a couple of different ones. Like, so sometimes the debate was, um, that people were making that as critical race theory over time, there's some people making it too personal, like, and too put much about personal narrative and personal story. And that it was getting away from the institutional and policy analysis. That was like one debate, kind of example of debate. But the other is like the capitalism uh, is a great example of this, right? Because you'll have critical race theorists who a- attack capitalism as part of that. And then you'll have other critical race theorists that don't. Right. Who say, you know, but actually it's not really you could have I mean, uh, I'm going to this is going to be overly simplistic, but who would say, you know, Karl Karl Marx, Marxism, for example, would have still enabled racial hierarchy. (laughs) Right. Like so. So it's it's that those are really interesting debates about what what does it mean to have an economic system and what does that economic system look like and would it reify still racial hierarchies or or would it be an actual strategy to supplant that? And, and integration has been a longstanding debate, right? As is integration, is, and this was my point about Derek Bell, as he came out of uh, um, a pro-integration litigation strategy and kind of developed critical race theory around, no, actually, we shouldn't have done that. Like that, was not, I mean, not the not the vision of what it was, but just that it could not happen and it was never going to happen. And so we shouldn't have been, we should have really questioned doing it and we should have just done what black parents wanted us to do. And that's a, it's a continuing debate is like integration, good or bad. Is it right or wrong? Is it, does it, does that, but you can have those kinds of debates across critical race theory, all as critical race theorists. Cause the point is it's about the critique and like all, like all critical thinking, by definition, critical thinking is not monolithic. It leads to debate. It leads to disagreement. <laughs> Sometimes some brawls. You know, we we know how to brawl in academia, right? I mean, yeah, we do. So, so, so yeah, I mean, it's like this idea of critical thinking skills. You know, is really central to it, right? The critical, the critical. <laughs> that's really central. And I think it's true of all critical studies, right? Because we got a little, a lot of different critical studies. Um, and critical race theory, remember, developed to be critical about race and racism when critical study, you know, critical studies was too race neutral. I mean, in other words, if they were lefties, they had a critique about society, but they were like, you're too classy, you're too focused on class, which is erasing racial hierarchy. And we would have racial hierarchy even if we eliminated class differences. So that's even across the critical theories. Critical feminism has, you know, there's there's black feminism in and the like. So you get all these really fascinating and I think interesting critical thinking and the, the critical thinking skills we develop, which are just central to being a democracy. Like we've got to, like it's like why we have school. I have, may, may I give you uh, one day? You, you have a, a, a big megaphone. You talk to a lot of people. May I give you one data point about uh, history of racism at Florida that maybe you'll quote as you talk to folks? Oh, yes, please. About our problems there. Uh, I, I shared this with uh, some new college folks just last weekend as, when we went on the tour. Uh, in 1842, when Florida was still a territory, the federal government passed what was called the, uh, the uh, Occupational the Armed Occupational Act of 1842. Mm -hmm. And that law gave 160 acres of land to any white male head of household who was willing to farm it. And that was not offered to black male heads of household. And once you did that, uh, took that first 160 acres, you get another. So I try to pass this on as as, as an example of the ability of whites to accumulate wealth based upon land acquisition that was not denied to blacks that is 
a data point on critical racism in Florida. I just totally, want to totally. that with you in case you want to share it. Yeah. No, just, just to no, see. No, I think that's, that's, you're dead right. And, t- and tell me the name of the statute again, armed, wait, I'm sorry. The armed, the armed Occupational Act of 1842. Got it's it. A federal, it's a federal law, federal law. Got it. Thank okay. You. I know you I know you'll take that forward. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Dr. Dunn. We are um we are coming close to our closing. I do want to just say if there's any burning last questions, people should drop them in the QA. And if it's all right, I'll read one one that's kind of long, um, but I think is worth reading to you. Is that all right? Great. Fantastic. So um get to it here. Um so this, uh, the question is, there is a new question of the, quote, implicated subject, which is a third category of persons outside of someone who is a perpetrator or victim. Not quite a bystander, the implicated subject is someone who participates in oppressive histories, whether or not they want to become implicated in that oppression, i.e. white people become implicated in racist histories because of the legacy of slavery. Do you think this discomfort with being an implicated subject is why the conservative reaction is to point fingers. The psychology is odd to me. How can conservatives now have changed the narrative to, quote, I'm not racist, you are racist, actually toward me, you are indoctrinating. It is projection and a fundamental misunderstanding of how to deal with guilt. Um, so I'm wondering if you have reactions to that. So one thing, thank you for that. And yes, I, I, I get the question. And and it's, I mean, it's one I, we could do a whole conversation about for an hour just on that, uh, longer. Um, what I think is so fascinating, um, and, and it's important to see as both opportunity and challenge, right? I think it is true that it is, it is the, one of the reasons why the attack on diversity, equity, inclusion, right? This is why Chris Rufo saw the opportunity in the materials is he could manipulate that sense of you're calling me a racist, right? That's the 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 way it gets experienced and that, you know, is, oh, well, I'm not racist, but you're calling me one. And that makes me feel bad and uncomfortable because I'm not. Like I don't agree with that. I think slavery was bad. I think Jim Crow is bad. I think black people are equal. And so it creates a defensiveness, right? That is manipulable. And he saw that opportunity and he utilized it. And so, um, but I think it's more than that as well. Like it's not that simple because we've also seen, because take take George Floyd. All these white people suddenly said, oh, wow, there really is this thing called systemic racism. But what happens when crime rates go up is the context changes. So really what people are saying, I'm scared now. I wasn't scared. I wasn't so scared before. <laughs> But now I'm feeling insecure about my own physical well-being in terms of crime. So now I just want to be safe. And so now I just want more cops. <laughs> like I will be safer. Th- I mean, it's like that reptilian brain of my dominant fear right now is very practical. And I'm just going to respond to get my fear addressed. And that's why we saw then this very fast. And by the way, even in the civil rights movement, if you think about when we saw the greatest gains in civil rights laws, it's a combination of things. But one of them was the economy was doing great. And so white people were not economically insecure in the way they've, you know, because wealth gap, the wealth gap, it's not just a racial wealth gap. There's also income inequality. Uh, and as we know, you can be a white family struggling to afford college. They, all of these become context for the ability for an organized strategic right with resources to manipulate people's insecurities and fears. So I would just say that to say it's not like it's an in, it it it's it is a problem that has occurred periodically, but it's also there's a complicated array that includes context that can make it easier or harder to tap it. And I think one of the opportunities we have right now is, as I said, in doing this trends analysis, people recognize democracy. This is a problem. Uh, people recognize, we. I was just talking to someone earlier about the fact that, look, uh, you know, there are all kinds of left wedges, that, <laughs> but we don't use them that way, right? We don't say, you know, we, I mean, abortion has become, you know, abortion rights is 
becoming one, right? Right. It's where, you know, you across the political spectrum, you have people saying, yeah, y'all gone too far. Um, but identity, we've seen, we've seen that folks think you should be free to be able to who you, who you want to be. Like, and that, I, that freedom to, of identity is actually very shared across. We're not utilizing that enough when we're talking about saying gay and what we're reading, you know, and what people should be allowed to, ch- allowed to choose for themselves. Cause remember what they're manipulating is a fear about grooming and child, you know, and pedophilia. It's not really like they're making it about like they're grooming your kids. I mean, they're using grooming language. They're talking about it as grooming. That means they're not really tapping just homophobia or they're tapping like your kids are in danger, right? So, so, So I'm just saying that because we have the opportunity to tap the other, the support of pluralism, the general agreement, including amongst some conservatives about, about freedoms that we agree on. That we so I'm just saying that to say it's so complicated, but yes, that's what they prey upon. And our opportunity is to think about um, like how we find that tapping the values. You know, as as a left, I think one of the mistakes we make is we're great at having an ideology and stating our ideology. Sometimes what we have to do is start with the value and really talk about the value and not the ideology, meaning. We all have to be able to be free who we are. By the way, so if you're a Christian who believes that you've been washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, you should be free to be a Christian washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. I don't have a problem saying that because it's not my, I believe in freedom to decide that that's what you believe. We don't do that enough. And so then people feel embattled in their own identities. So I think we have an opportunity that we need to lean into. But it is real, and they manipulate it. Okay, thank you so much for that. I wish we could take five more questions and spend some more time with you here, but we are at time. Um, and I just want to thank you so much for bringing your expertise tonight to this conversation on this critical conversation on critical race theory. Um, Dr. Dunn, thank you so much for bringing oh, no, your right, please, thank you. I'm, I, no, no, this was just brilliant. Thank you so much. So much. Here and your questions and your embeddedness in Florida, which is really ground zero so much for for these uh, these struggles today for um, getting access to information uh, and to education uh, that is so desperately needed. So I just want to thank you both again. And I do want to remind our audience that um, All Liberal Arts ha- does have one more um, upcoming lecture uh, in this series with Jonathan Friedman, uh, the third installment of his three-part lecture series, Free Expression and, and Education, which would be very much uh, on the broader topics here that we've been discussing tonight. That's next Tuesday, November 21st at 4 p.m. Eastern. Um, so tune into that. Uh, check out uh, the work of Maya Wiley. Uh, share the video out with friends. Check out the work of Dr. Dunn. Uh, get involved. Uh, There's a lot to be done, as we know. And uh, thank you all so much for joining us tonight. Thank you so much. And I I just want to thank both Professor Wallenberg, Professor Dunn, Professor D. Becker, (laughs) uh, because, you know, we couldn't have this without your incredible work as educators. And I know how hard it's been. So I just want to acknowledge and thank you for it. All right. Well, keep up the fight. Yeah. We'll keep up the fight. Thank you. Yes, we will.